Welcome to Curiosity Cake, the podcast about ideas for people with curious minds and big appetites. I'm Lee Delaney. I've made it my mission to bring you a feast of ideas across science, technology, humanities, society and culture and more. Each episode, I'll be talking to an expert from academia or industry to find out about their work and what we can learn from it. If you like what you hear, please tip generously by telling your friends and leaving a review on your podcast platform of choice. On this episode, we're finding out about historical martial arts with Guy Windsor. Guy has been fundamental in the development of historical martial arts. He's a consulting swordsman, teacher and writer. He researches and teaches medieval and renaissance Italian swordsmanship and has a PhD in recreating historical martial arts. He also runs the School of European Swordsmanship and has released multiple books on this subject. This episode is one of three being published on the same day, so do check out the other two. But for now, get yourself a cup of tea, grab a fork and dig into a slice of curiosity cake. Curiosity Cake. Guy Windsor, welcome to Curiosity Cake. Hello. Uh, it's always my pleasure to talk about swords. So I guess the best place to start then really is if you can give us a, a brief idea of what historical martial arts are. Well, as I see it, and there's more than one opinion on this subject, but as I see it, historical martial arts are martial arts which are derived from historical research. So if you're getting your technical information about how to, for example, swing a sword around uh, from some kind of historical source, for example, a book written a couple hundred years ago or whatever, then it's historical martial arts. Obviously, the books don't cover absolutely everything. So historical martial arts tend to include things which are not explicitly covered because you know they don't have um, an explicit answer to every single sword problem. And they often don't cover things like how to train and do push-ups and things like that. Um, but if the, if the core art that you're practicing is derived in its techniques and principles from a historical source, then as I see it, it's a historical martial art. So it's very contrasted to kind of modern martial arts, like maybe mixed martial arts, things like that. Sure. Well, you do, yeah. Yeah. You do what your coach tells you. So in, 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 if you're a mixed martial artist, your coach is God and you do what they say. And, and hopefully you win matches that way, right? Um, for us, like, for example, if you came to one of my regular classes, the highest authority in the room is actually the book that's open on a lectern. Um, so if we're doing a technique and I say, and this is how the exchange of thrust goes, da, 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 you can go and look up the exchange of thrust from the manuscript or a facsimile of the manuscript, obviously. And then if I've got, I don't know, my left foot forward and then the book is the right foot forward, you can come up to me and say, but guy, hang on, in the book, it's left foot forward. You've got your right foot forward. Would you, would you mind explaining that? And that's not actually rude. That shows you're paying attention. And the it could be, I'll say, yes, you're right. I'm doing it wrong. Let's do it differently. That occasionally happens. Um, more often it's, yes, you're right. Uh, we are doing it this way for this particular reason. Or most commonly, the book is showing us the, the fundamental idea of the technique. And what we are now doing is applying that idea in practice and seeing how things change. Okay, so, um, but the point is that the book is the, or the writer of the book is the ultimate authority. Yeah. Um, and you've played a really big part in the development of historical martial arts. I've, I've been doing it a long time. Um, how... And I've had lots and lots of students, so I, I, I guess it's, it's a kind thing to say, and I'm, you know, I guess it's at least partly true. I mean, I started deliberately practicing historical martial arts, as in you know, researching and figuring out how to do these techniques from books. In about, we started in about 1993, um, so that's 27 years ago, and I've been teaching for a living for the last 20 years, so it's been like my primary you know, source of income and everything. In fact, my sole source of income for the last 20 years. So, so what made you pick up a sword for the first time? Ah, okay. That's like the key question, really. <laughs> as, as I see it, the world divides into fundamentally two kinds of people, okay? Some people, they see a sword 
and they light up and automatically reach for it. And other people don't. They may have that same reaction to, I don't know, um, clothing or, or knitting or cars or football or something like that. Right. Mm, it's making me think of football. If right. lots of people, you see a ball on the floor, you kick it around a bit. Right. Some people will just walk on past. Right. I would walk on past the football, but I would automatically reach for the sword. So basically my, my students uh, come from that pool of people for whom the why would you like swords is it's, 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 it's almost a meaningless question. It's like if you, it's like being a parent. Some people want to be parents and some people don't. And if you want to be a parent, it's just it's just an irreducible desire. And your life is always going to be somewhat empty until you have kids. Same is true with some people when it comes to swords. Their life is going to be... Well, as one student said to me many years ago, she came up to me and she said, Guy, there has been a sword-shaped hole in my life for the last 20 years and now it's been filled. And that was like one of the best things anybody ever said to me in my whole life, which is why I remember it like 15 years later. Um, so, you know, some of us are born with a sword shaped hole in our souls and only the sword will fill it. And, you know, <laughs> and some of us aren't, and that's perfectly okay. I make, it is not a value judgment. It's just an observation. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I have, you know, my, my best friends, um, many of them have no interest in swords at all. So that you can be a perfectly good person and not like swords. There's no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, no judgment implied is, but you know, for some of us. So, you know, basically I took up swords the instant they became available. Um, and I'd been looking for them. You know, my parents were taking blades off me when I was little. <laughs> um, and, you know, my first career after university was as a woodworker. And a large part of the attraction of woodworking is sharp steel. Mm. So it's just, there's just something magical about a sharp steel edge um and yeah and when that sharp steel edge is four feet long and you get to swing it around it's just fantastic mm. i think was it um fencing that you first started with well no see i first got into martial arts um because just there were no weapons available and so when i was about 11 or 12 i started doing karate uh, I was living in Gaborone, Botswana at the time, and this Korean chap living in Gaborone started a karate club. There's like three or four of us students at the golf club in Gaborone. And, you know, I, I, I think we should start an Occupy Golf Courses movement where martial artists just go and take over golf courses because let's face it, <laughs> the golfers don't need or deserve all of that space. But anyway. Um, so good reflex training, yeah. watching our balls while you're practicing. Yeah, well, there is that. Um, so yeah, so we would, we would train there, and that then my school started a karate club, largely thanks to me agitating for one for years, and they finally got around to starting one. Um, and then I moved from my prep school to my public school, um, where they had a fencing club, and finally I could do fencing because you know my mom had told me that actual sword fighting is called fencing and so I always wanted to do fencing and my grandfather was a fencer uh, I actually have a picture of him here in my study up on the wall aged about 15 16 in about 1910 and he's wearing his fencing uniform and sitting in a chair with his fencing trophies on the table beside him uh, he used to fence for his school so you know, my actual first fencing lesson was when I was about eight, which was my grandfather sitting in an armchair, which is also here in my study. Uh, he was sitting in an armchair, smoking a roll-up cigarette, and kind of I was standing there holding a foil, and he would say, like, extension, lunge. And I would stick my arm out and lunge, and he'd go, recover, and I'd do it. So he just sat there and barked orders, and I tried to do what I was told. And that was, yeah, that was heaven, because it was like a proper sword fighting lesson. But it didn't really go very far because at that time he was living in London, we were living in Africa. And so there was, um, I didn't get a lot of chance to actually train with him. So as soon as I got to school where they had a fencing club, I was like, yes, okay, I'm doing this. And I did that um, to the exclusion of all other physical activity, pretty much. Um, that, that took over from the other martial arts? Well, okay. At the school I went to, 
there was no karate club. There was no, there were no other martial arts available. Fencing was available. And frankly, for at least the first couple of years, fencing was enough. I missed the kicks and punches, but swords, see the whole point of a sword is if you do everything right, you don't actually need to you know, get all sweaty, kicking and punching and wrestling and what have you. You can just poke somebody and they fall down. <laughs> it's, it's, it's martial arts for lazy people, really. Um, <laughs> So, so I was doing sport fencing for like five years at school. And then when I went up to university in 92, obviously like it was, it was great. I got there and on Monday nights, it was fencing, Tuesday nights, Tai Chi, Wednesday nights, fencing, Thursday nights, Tai Chi, Friday nights, Kabuto, so Japanese weapon stuff, karate on Saturdays and sometimes karate on Sundays as well. But there's also fencing tournaments and things on Sundays. So, you know, the fact that I got a degree is kind of an accident. It was all squeezed in between all these martial arts lessons. It's make me feel like I've totally wasted all the spare time I had at university. <laughs> ah, well, you know, priorities, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so after starting fencing at university, or well, after you know, joining the fencing club at university and going to tournaments and what have you, it just got really frustrating how modern fencing sport fencing in the early 90s uh, was no longer really connected to its martial roots at all. And it was basically a very high speed, athletic, highly skilled game of tag. Okay. It didn't matter what the outcome would have been with sharps. It only mattered what lights went off. Right. And so, sharps being like real swords. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Real swords. So it, it didn't, you know, it, it just didn't have the the essence of what I was looking for. And so I met a, a fellow fencer, a chap called Paul. Um, I guess it was late 92, early 93. And we were similarly frustrated. And so we started digging around a bit. And I came across a book in my granny's house, which had belonged to my grandfather, who was sadly dead by that point, called The Sword and the Centuries by Alfred Hutton. And in that, it had all sorts of descriptions of like how people were fighting with swords, you know, in the 16th century in the 17th century with like illustrations from these manuals that had been written back then. I was like, are you seriously telling me that back in the 16th century, somebody who actually had to fight with swords actually properly in a sword fighting culture wrote a book telling you exactly how to do it. Oh my God. It was one of those sort of shibboleth moments. So there's those, those watershed moments in her life. And so then Paul and I started digging and we found you know, his historical fencing manuals in the National Library of Scotland, um, in various other libraries. There were even a few in the university library and started researching and started sort of in a very kind of cat handed and clumsy way, <laughs> started trying to, trying to piece together the um you know the, the arts that were being represented in these books that we'd found and after a while we realized we were bored of just fencing each other so we started looking for friends and then we thought you know what we need to have a proper club and so in 94 we started a club called the dawn duelist society which is still operating That's a great name yeah 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 it's a good club uh, it's still going in edinburgh um 26 years later so that's that's nice um uh, oh, yeah. I, I can take no credit for that because I left in 2001 um, to, to move to Finland. So, so yeah, so I've kind of gone off on a tangent. Where do, <laughs> what's the actual <laughs> question again? <laughs> it, it was essentially how you got into oh, okay. yeah. in, the, in the first place, how you yeah. picked up your, your yeah. first sword. Yeah, so I, I guess my first like proper sword that wasn't like a modern fencing weapon would have been a small sword that Paul found in an antique shop in Edinburgh in like 93. And it was like, okay, this thing is pointy. You stab somebody with this and it's going in right now. We're in business. This is the real thing. Um, so yeah. And then from there over time, you've been really involved heavily throughout your life with researching yes. um, techniques and strategy and, and the history exactly. and setting up schools and teaching yes yeah so 
I decided to do it for a living um, in 2000. And 2001, I opened my school in Helsinki. And I've been researching. I mean, fundamentally, I am, I am, should we say, a teacher first and a martial artist second and a researcher third. So the, my, my best learning environment is teaching. Okay, it's when it's when I have you know, the most patience and the most uh, access to you know my better self, right? So like if I'm ever stuck on a problem and I'm home alone doing something, and maybe it's a woodworking problem or it's a writing problem or whatever, I conjure up an imaginary student and I teach them how to do it, and it always goes ten times better. Um, that sounds very like the Richard Richard Feynman technique for learning if you can actually teach something to someone else okay it helps you learn it better oh sure um yeah. so so then the reason i do the reason i teach martial arts is because that's what i'm most interested in and the reason i teach historical martial arts is because those happen to be the types of martial arts i'm, I'm most interested in sword fights and the so the research is there so that i have an authentic martial art to teach my students if I did, so what makes you most interested in them is it is it the sword or is there more to it because you're, you're obviously very passionate about the sword um yeah there's just okay i, I generally like weapons um and it, it could be because my big brother was horrible to me when i was little and <laughs> so i like the idea i've always been charmed or even um you know seduced by the idea that somebody who is smaller and weaker can beat the living shit out of somebody who is bigger and stronger if they have the right training i just love Which, that idea yeah right. and, and it can be a big selling point for martial arts absolutely and and unfortunately it's often bullshit because, <laughs> yeah. because you know mass and strength matter in a fight but if you have a weapon then that is that equalizes things considerably. Um, so you know, for example, modern soldiers, they don't have to be particularly big and strong if they're good at shooting. Mm. Yeah, I mean, they need to be fit and stuff and whatever. But basically, if it ever comes down to who who would win in an arm wrestle, something's gone very very wrong in the battle. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because boxing, mixed martial arts. Uh, people compete against it, each other within weight classes, so they exactly. fight people who are similar size, similar weight, right? Because the size matters. Uh, exactly, exactly, and that's the thing about um, yeah. I, I see mixed martial arts as a modern form of the duel, where the idea is you have two equal opponents and they fight, and the reason that they should be equal is because you get a better fight that way, right? Because it's for the spectators. It's it's a, it's like the the prize fighters in the 18th century. Okay, you want something with a competitive edge, right? So you know, if you put me in a ring with um, I don't know Mike Tyson or whatever in a boxing match, I it's not a no one's going to pay to watch that because it's going to take approximately two seconds, and then I'm, I'm lying on the floor unconscious, and they have to ship me off to the hospital, and it's just a waste of time, right? So you want equality so that you have an interesting fight to watch yeah um for the sort of martial arts i'm most interested in they've always they've always been related to the duel which has the same basic idea that the the two combatants ought to be equal the weapons should be equal there is no element of surprise there is the the way it's normally framed, because we're talking about historical martial arts, the way it's normally framed is they are social equals. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, in Napoleonic times, it was generally considered bad form for officers to duel officers of, of a different rank. Yeah. So majors could duel majors, but a major can't challenge a general. Um, so and that is, that's because fundamentally the duel is about a display of honorable behavior. Mm. Um, and there is no honor to be gained if somebody of higher social rank destroys somebody of lower social rank. Does that make sense? 
Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. There's like an ethics yeah. to it. Exactly. So, so we've always had this this sense in sort of European dueling culture of the duel ought to be fought between equals, and the weapons ought to be equal, and there should be no advantage because if if one of them goes to the field with an unfair advantage, then then the whole social point of the fight is lost. If that makes sense, because uh, you know, yeah. combat combat is always a social um, phenomenon, and it's 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 always fought for some sort of social reason. Even now, if you, even you get mugged on the street, there's a social reason for it. Um, so to me, the the I'm I'm not particularly big. I'm not particularly strong. I'm not particularly fast or anything else. But I'm quite highly trained, and so sword in hand. And with a rule set that allows me to use my advantages, then I, I will fence anyone. Uh, yeah, if you if you have a rule set that that emphasizes using the sword, with well, a, you know you're fighting against someone that doesn't well, have that skill, but is maybe physically bigger and stronger, but can't use those right. attributes. Well, let, um, actually, I'm thinking more. I'm not. Talking about okay, I, I have actually. Let me give you a specific example. I have fenced a guy who was about six foot seven, and pretty skilled and experienced. Okay, the rules we were fighting meant that contact, you know, a reasonable cut to the the arms or head or whatever counted as a hit. Okay, we weren't actually trying to break bones or remove body parts or anything like that. It was a friendly fencing match. Okay, mm-hmm. wrestling was allowed. If I'd allowed him to wrestle, he would have just demolished me, yeah. right? Because, you know, I, I, I can do the grapply stuff a bit. You know, I'm not completely incompetent at it, but there's no way. And he, this guy was competent at it and built like a Greek god, six foot seven, biceps the size of my head, right? There's just no, no contest, right? But under the rules of the game, um, I didn't have any trouble because even though he had much longer reach than me, I could get out of the way and strike over his wrists. Mm. And so if the swords were sharp and we were not wearing armor, I'd have cut his sword hand off. So, you know, which is a really good start to a sword fight. If you're fighting somebody for real and you manage to cut their sword hand off, you, you really do have an advantage. <laughs> on, right? and, and probably, <laughs> probably a bit of a disadvantage for wrestling as well. Well, yeah, quite. Um, <laughs> uh, but as, but if, if as you know, some rule sets, some rule sets disallow grappling or you know close quarter stuff altogether, which I don't approve of because it's it's how this stuff was fought historically. Um, some rule sets um, don't allow hits to the arm, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, so if the guy has much longer reach than me, and I can't take out the forward target, I have to get close enough to hit him in the body or the head then I'm at a huge disadvantage because he can hit me from maybe half a meter further away than I can hit him. Yeah. So it, yeah, the rule sets matter. Um, Mm. And yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we're getting, we're starting to get into some technical stuff, but (laughs) I I wanted, I wanted to cover if we can go into a bit more depth then about what historical European martial arts are. Because it's not just one art; there's a range right. of arts and styles. Okay, right now you are now you are firmly within my area of maximum nerdery, <laughs> and, and then we can get deep into the technical stuff. Okay, um, let's just okay. Historical European martial arts is a is a common sort of umbrella term for what I do. I personally don't consider the European bit to be particularly useful because it's not. In the periods that we're talking about, it wasn't really used at the time. Yeah. So, for example, in 15th century Europe, they weren't talking about a European this and a European that. It was a French this and a Milanese that and a Genoan this and a Aragonese that. Do you see what I mean? So yeah. Europe, Europe was much more um, sort of split up into small states. And at the same time, when they did um, fight against together against a common threat, it was Christendom against Islam. 
Mm. Right. Which, of course, there's no way in hell I would teach Christendom martial arts because it, <laughs> it, it's just it's just a it's just a it's just a horrible idea, isn't it? Like, OK, you can only practice this if you are Christian. It's like, no, that's ridiculous. You know, I, I have students in the Philippines who are Muslims. Right. And they are practicing a, a martial art from Christendom, but we don't even use the term Christendom. But that would be the historically correct term for a 15th century martial art, except, of course, that there was no unified Christendom-ish martial art at the time, right? There was, you know, knightly combat of the period, say, of, let's say 1400 as a, as a date, so we can get a few specifics in, okay? The, the two martial arts styles that we know most about from 1400 is a German style of um, sword combat known as um, Kunstfechten, which is art of fencing or art of arms, art of fighting, um, which are the from sources written by the uh, lineage descendants of somebody called Johannes Lichtenauer, okay, who wrote a series of um, mnemonic verses, and then there are a whole load of treatises which are commentaries on those mnemonic verses with illustrations and what have you okay so mm -hmm. there is this german style and then the other style that we have significant source material for from 1400 is from a uh, four manuscripts attributed to a chap called fiore de liberi who comes from premariaco which is sort of on the italian and austrian border and it's written in Italian. It's clearly Italian, but he nowhere in his book does he talk about Italy. Um, and so those two styles of knightly combat are very closely related in some areas, but they the entire conceptualization of the art is different. The the intellectual structures used to describe the art is completely different. Um, so the different areas that an art develops in really gives the arts their own particular flavors. Yeah, and, and also what concepts are described and what concepts are assumed. Okay, so My favorite example for this is in Europe, we tend to have uh, like a street map has named streets and the blocks between the streets are not named and the buildings are numbered according to where they are along the street, okay? In Japan, maps are the other way around. Blocks are named, the streets between the blocks are unnamed, and buildings are numbered according to when they were built in that block. Oh, this explains why it was so hard to get around Beijing when I lived there. I don't know if it's the same in China. <laughs> I know this is true for Japan. I'm not sure if it's true for China. Okay, so the point is, like, the Postal Service has no difficulty in Japan or in Europe finding the right house to deliver a letter to, okay? But the conceptualization of what needs to be defined and what can be left blank is different, okay? And that is true in, if we compare the medieval German material to the medieval Italian material, um, there are, the, just the way everything is organized and the specific techniques that are sort of brought out to be examined closely are different. Okay. And also, interestingly enough, interesting to me anyway, <laughs> tell, tell me if I go on too long. <laughs> um, the, the, in the German sources, we have, for example, the longsword of Johannes Lichtenauer, and then we have maybe mounted combat attributed to a different source and dagger stuff attributed to a different source and some wrestling attributed to a different source. Okay. All within so the same manuscript. A... Yeah. Whereas, yeah. whereas Fiore has a single coherent vision of the art of arms, which has wrestling and dagger and sword and spear and polax in armor, out of armor, on foot, on horseback, all in one book and all one consistent vision of the whole thing. Okay. So the, the places where we find real differences in technique is pretty much only, 
I've got it. Okay, if any of my colleagues listen to this, I know some of them are going to jump up now going, no, guy, no, guy, that's the oversimplification. <laughs> um, but but um, basically, what, what um, if we look at the sword play out of armor on foot, we have really distinct differences in um, some techniques. There are a bunch of techniques from the German material that is different from the Italian material, and we have the whole sort of the fencing theory of the German stuff is different to the fencing theory of the Italian stuff. Okay. Mm-hmm. But if you, if you looked at all the armored combat stuff, you would say, well, it's all the same techniques, really. Is that because of the limitations of fighting in armor? Um, possibly. Um, I, I don't know. Um, nobody knows. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, the whole point of historical martial arts, as I see it, is not just to get good at sword fighting, but it's to get good at sword fighting within a particular style from a particular source, understanding its context and its historical context, its martial context, its fencing context. So, you know, a, a, a style that is optimized for fighting with a sword and buckler without armor is always going to be different to a style that's optimized for fighting with a polax in armor. Yeah. And a style which is intended for, shall we say 16th century Italian merchants to, you know, have some fun in the sal and maybe defend themselves in the street afterwards is always going to be different to what is taught to, for example, um, military recruits in England in the 18th century. Right. And we have sources for all of this, right? So what makes it a properly historical martial art, I think, is the, the practitioner is understanding where their art is coming from and what assumptions are, are therefore made by the author and what the limitations are of the style. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong with, you know, I mean, what I personally do, so I hope there's nothing wrong with it, is I do lots and lots of different styles. Uh, I specialize in a few, but you know I've done 18th century English saber stuff. I've done uh, 18th century French small sword stuff. I've done Italian rapier stuff from the early 17th century. I've done um, German sword and buckler from the early 14th century. And I've done most of my work in Fiore's art of arms. So wrestling, dagger, sword, spear, polax. I've done a little bit of mounted combat, but I'm not nearly a good enough rider to be good at it. I've done it in armor, out of armor, all that sort of stuff, right? So um, when when you're recreating a sword fighting style, you need to understand the context it's going to be used in and the context that it's coming from. And that's what makes it really historical to me. Hmm. And do all of the different styles, um, everything comes back to the idea of dueling, like a one-on-one fight? Generally speaking, yes. Yeah. Okay. We don't have much in the way of sort of uh, troop movements. You know, how, how, you know, okay. In, you can the, the infantry manual from the Second World War, the American infantry manual from the Second World War. There's a special name for it; it, it escapes me momentarily. Will tell you how you and your platoon should approach a machine gun post, for example. Right? Mm. We don't have that kind of material from much earlier. We do know about you know pike formations and musket formations and things like that, but um, all of my all of my research has been focused on sword fights and all of the sword fighting stuff focuses on the duel. And that's primarily, I think, because the duel has always stood in for the, the proper test of a martial person. Mm. Yeah. Well, this is, this is your live training, your live um, testing out of, Right. And how good your skill is and your techniques. Yeah. And, you know, yes, war is, is the ultimate test, but the, for example, somebody who was very good at say jousting and feats of arms in the early 15th century, 
um, would be given command of a unit because it, it was reckoned that their martial prowess is a virtue and that virtue will be applicable outside of the specific context in which it was demonstrated in the duel. Mm. Um, I don't actually think that that's necessarily a very good way of selecting <laughs> army commanders today. Um, but the, the, the reason that the, these books were very expensive to produce generally, and um, they were aimed at people who could afford to buy them. So they were, or, or, who, or who commissioned them, or who could afford to commission them. So they are, they're representing the, the apotheosis of combat, which is the single combat between equals, right? Because that, that's the highest expression of the art, so that's what goes into the book. Um, Julian, something you see in cinema a lot, like in, in lots of films. Yeah. Um, and it's one of those things where when I see it, I sometimes wonder, like, how realistic is this? How often are people doing this? Um, so in, in, in terms of the actual history around dueling, was it something that happened a lot? Was it something that happened over a long period of time? Okay, dueling has been around in Europe since forever. Um, I mean, Hector and Achilles dueled under the walls of Troy, <laughs> right? So when I say forever, I'm talking like a really long time. So, and you know, it, it's always had, um, well, there's, there's been a lot of variety in its place in European culture. So for instance, you would have perhaps two commanders would duel and the outcome would decide the battle so the troops didn't have to fight. That was not terribly mm -hmm. common, I don't believe, but it certainly happened. Um, two people would duel for... Um, social reasons and people would deal for legal reasons and again if we go to because it changed so much over time it's, it's probably helpful if we go to like a more specific period so should we say 1540 um, that sort of period duels at that point there was the legal duel which was literally a legal um, due process where there were very specific rules about who could challenge who and for what reasons, very specific protocols around what weapons and stuff could be used and where the fight would happen and who had to be there to marshal the fight and what the consequences would be for the outcome. So, for instance, if it was a mortal matter, let's say you accuse me of murder um, and I denied it and there was no evidence and so we ended up having a judicial duel about it. If I won and you survived, you would be executed for making a false accusation in a capital case, right? If, if you won, but in a way that didn't actually kill me, then I would then be executed for murder because murder had been proved upon my, upon my person. Hmm. Right. Um, so that sort of thing, generally speaking, ended in 1547 with the duel between um, Jarnac and Shashamire. I'm probably mangling the pronunciation of poor Shashamire, but he lost anyway, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Where they, they fought, um, and the King of France, his favourite, probably boyfriend, um, lost the fight. Uh, and it's, it's so very, very French. I mean, it's amazing. Um, Shishamire accused Jarnac of sleeping with, I think it was his stepmother. And Jarnac denied it and it ended up going to the duel. And Shishamire was incredibly confident and had laid out a feast for celebration after his great victory. But Jarnac had hired an Italian fencing master. And, <laughs> and this, this is all, as far as we know, true. Right? I'm not making any of this up. Yeah. Um. And also it was, it was known that, um, that Shishanere was particularly good at uh, wrestling and what have you. And so Jarnak made sure that they had daggers as well as their swords so that if it did get to a wrestling match, he could stab him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's just all sorts of things like that. And 
and Jarnak won the fight by slicing the back of Shoshana Ray's leg. And that ended the fight because um, Shoshana Ray couldn't stand up, right? And they bandaged him up and he, he probably would have survived, except he was so angry at having lost and so sort of embarrassed by it, he tore off the dressings and bled to death. So, I mean, we're not talking. We're, we're talking about people who had a very different concept of what was worth living for than we do. I was thinking it sounded quite melodramatic before that bit, and yeah. I just took it to another level. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a fantastic story, but anyway, so that's the the legal duel, the the trial by combat, the judicial duel. Okay, but all the time throughout history, there have been the illegal duel where gentlemen and it's almost always gentlemen, settled matters to their own satisfaction um, in secret against the law, right? It's dueling is a sort of not legal dueling, so dueling as opposed to the judicial duel, so private dueling, if you like, has almost always been illegal, but it has also almost always been entirely winked at by the courts. Um, so, for example, the last duel in Scotland was in 1830s, I think it was. And um, the guy who won shot the guy who lost. (laughs) So they shot at each other and, and, and everyone agreed that the guy who got shot totally had it coming, right? But, and then, you know, word got out and an arrest warrant was issued for the, the chap who won and he duly appeared in court. And the same judge who had sent a little girl um, to Australia for seven years for shoplifting, let him go because, well, it was a matter of honour and it's basically okay, really. It's against the law and technically it's murder, but you're a gentleman and it was all done properly, so that's okay. Right? <laughs> it's nuts. It's completely nuts. Um, but to give you an idea of like the social pressure involved, like the Duke of Wellington uh, was ad- just really strongly against dueling his whole life. Right. He absolutely despised it when officers under his command would duel each other. He thought, you know, well, it's your job to fight the French, not each other. Right. Um, but the I believe it was the Earl of Winchelsea said things in the House of Commons that the Duke couldn't, or maybe it was the House of Lords, I forget, um, that the Duke couldn't possibly ignore. And so they ended up meeting, as in to shoot at each other. It was a pistol duel. Mm-hmm. And I'm not 100% certain whether they deloped. Uh, deloping is when you deliberately miss in a pistol duel. Um, but they didn't actually hit each other, but they both discharged their pistols. Honor was satisfied and they could go home again. Okay, Because the funny thing about the duel, the private duel for honor, is that your honor has been challenged and so it must be restored. And you show up, and when you show up, you and you know sort of follow the rules of the fight. You know you have the proper weapons, and you don't cheat, and that sort of stuff. Just by showing up and following the rules, your honor is restored. It doesn't actually it's like matter. A face. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't actually matter who wins. It's like it's not like let's say if it was a private deal. Let's say I don't know you said something and and I took an exception to it and we ended up facing each other with small swords at dawn around the you know around the back of Hyde Park. Okay. Right. Um you show up with your sword and you stand your ground and you know you have your second and what have you and we begin to fence. Right? If you run me through, fine. If I run you through, fine. If we just pink each other and then decide we've had enough, fine. Doesn't matter. Honor is now restored. Yeah. It's not like, okay, if you stab me, then it means you were right. That's not how it works. That's how it works in a judicial combat, but it's not how it works in in a private duel for honor. Yeah. So honor is restored by simply showing up. Um, So it's a really, it's a really odd and very specific context. Mm -hmm. Um, And, so again, for a historical martial artist has to understand the context for which the art that they are practicing was actually intended. Okay, and I don't think it's useful to limit it to 
European martial arts, not only because it's not a terribly useful sort of distinction, but also because, for example, I have a colleague, um, Manusha, in Persia or in Iran, as you know, I'm not sure where he lives, but he studies Persian martial arts from Persian sources. Okay, mm -hmm. so he is recreating, he's doing exactly the same process of studying the sources, translating them when necessary, figuring out what they mean, working through the actions in practice, figuring out what weapons, what weapons were like and how they should be carried and how they should be held and all that sort of stuff. Um, so he's absolutely doing historical martial arts, but they're definitely not European because they come from Persia. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, there are similar efforts afoot in all sorts of places so well there's a real difference there isn't there with something like kendo japanese swordsmanship where in his in the historical arts you know persian european whatever you're having to go to books to to find these sources uh to learn the techniques and styles yeah Whereas maybe in Japan, there are people who've passed this down over and over again yeah. over time that Ken, they can learn directly from people. Kendo is not a great example because it's only about 100 years old. Um, and it, and it's, it's, a, it's not a historical martial, arts, martial art in that sense because yeah. it's, it's, it's a, a sport. Okay, my, my friends who do kendo will vehemently argue that it's not a sport. Right? And I, I agree with them, but, but for the sake of, it's not attempting to recreate the art of the samurai. It is its own thing. Okay. But I have also have friends who study um, Japanese martial arts, uh, swordsmanship particularly, that has been passed down from generations of masters through the last like 300 years, 400 years or whatever, certainly dating back to, the time when the samurai were what we think of as samurai, you know, fighting each other's swords all the time. Okay, so pre Meiji era. Okay, and when I say masters, I mean one of the most outstanding examples I can think of is is a woman in California who I saw do a demonstration of naginata technique that just blew my mind. And this is many years ago, and I've sadly forgotten her name. But what, what is naginata? A naginata is basically think of a of a Japanese sword blade at the end of a six foot stick, mm -hmm. and prepare to be very afraid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, There's, I've I've mangled the description slightly, but basically it's a glaive in, in European mm -hmm. terms. So it's, it's a big long blade on the end of a big long stick, and so her naginata stuff is it's traditionally a women's weapon. And and so it's passed down a female line. Um, the the most of the Japanese sword arts I'm familiar with are generally being passed down a male line. But these days, at least, you do get very high level practitioners of both sexes in in all of these things. Um, I really shouldn't talk too much about Japanese martial arts because you know I, I've studied a bit, yeah. but it's not my area of expertise. But the point is that that they have they have unbroken lineages dating back to the time when the swords were used for real. Mm. And they have, well, for example, David Lowry, who's written some excellent books on the subject and knows vastly more about Japanese martial arts than I ever will. He describes the Japanese swordsmanship that he does as historical because it has been passed down from a historical precedent. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't use the term historical that way. I would say that as a lineage-based martial art. And I, I have to respectfully disagree with um, this Larry when he sort of gives the impression that the art hasn't changed in that time because I don't think it's possible to have a person-to-person -person transmission over the course of generations without the art changing. Um, so, so again, people use the term historical to mean different things. The way I'm using it is it comes from a book written in the period. Yeah. Um, and you've mentioned quite a few of the weapons there that would be specific to um, the European arts. Um, so can, can you say a bit more about the different kinds of weapons, what they are? Oh, sure. OK. Here's here's a, a mental image for you. OK. Think of like the gaming world or fantasy fantasy games, fantasy movies, whatever, and you have these incredibly bizarre weapons that people are, are using. 
right? And now imagine the historical record standing there with one eye, eyebrow raised saying, hold my beer, right? <laughs> because we have surviving examples of absolutely astonishingly crazy weapons, like a, a pistol crossbow that's also a sword, right? <laughs> Seriously, it's fabulous. It's a fantastic thing. There's in the Wallace Collection in London, there is this sword. Well, it look, it's a sword in the scabbard, okay? And it looks a little bit funny, but it's a sword in the scabbard. And if you look at the pommel, there's a kind of hole in the pommel that doesn't look quite right. Um, but actually, the blade inside is spring-loaded. And you, so you have your left hand on, your, on the hilt of your sword, which is not a threat. That's just what you do to steer the point around so that you don't end up hitting people. Okay, So it's perfectly non-threatening to have your left hand on the sword hilt and you draw it with your right. Of course, right hand, left-handers would have it on the, the right hip. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right? But you press a button and a three-foot steel blade is shot out of the pommel and locks in place. So if you and I stand there having an argument and I decide that it's, the time has come for action, I press the button and there's a blade sticking in your gut and I can just shove it and pull it out. And now I have effectively a short pole arm with a three foot sword blade on the end of a three foot scabbard shaped handle, right? So there are, there are no books to tell you how to use that. But there are all, <laughs> there are all sorts of um, of weapons. Some of them come from farming backgrounds. Like we have flails, for instance, and we have some some flail techniques in some books. Um, and when we say flail, I mean like a six foot stick with a three foot club attached to it by a hinge, or maybe a two foot club attached to it by a hinge. Right. So it's a it's a meaty weapon. Very difficult to train with a partner without actually killing them. Um, we have, I mean, just looking at the sword rack in front of me right now in my office, um, we have small swords, which are about three feet long, have a triangular blade. They don't cut, but they make nasty triangular holes that heal very slowly, if at all. Um, we have falchions or messers. They have lots of different names which is basically has like a two foot slightly curved blade and a, with a sword hilt on it. Um, there are sabers, which are similar to that, only longer with a wider blade, often curved. Curved is my preference. We have what's called a scavener, which is a so we say late 16th century Italian sword of a Slavic type, which has this kind of ornate basket over the hand and a long straight blade. Uh, Spada de Filo is hanging on the rack right behind it, which has, again, a long straight blade. Maybe the blade's like three feet long, but with more of a, what you'd think of maybe as a rapier hilt. So it has like a, a knuckle bow and some rings. And we have a proper rapier, which has, uh, well, the one I'm looking at right now is about um, four feet long. The blade itself, I know, is 45 inches by itself. So that's it's, it's a little bit over four feet long. It has kind of that swirly um, steel bar hilt. It's called a swept hilt, where you have these, these steel bars that kind of wrap around the hand. Mm-hmm. Um, underneath that, there's a long sword, actually several, which is about, again, four feet long, quite a wide blade, narrowing to a point, um, simple cross guard, no other defense for the hands. It's just the plain cross guard. Uh, These are maybe the kinds of swords we see more in films and things. Yeah, well, it depends on the film. I mean, you know, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings tends to go for the long sword. Um, Three Musketeers tend to go for a rapier. Uh, there's a wonderful film directed by Ridley Scott, if I remember rightly, called The Duelists. Um, where they, they the first duel in the film is with small swords, but um, several of the others are with sabers. So we do see something of a range. And funnily enough, the f- generally speaking, if it's small swords and sabers, the choreography tends to be quite good. And if it's anything else, it tends to be appallingly crap. Um, <laughs> because frankly, a proper rapier match doesn't look like anything on the screen because mm-hmm. you're not waving the sword around and whacking them together yeah you're sort of you're doing these little tiny um 
sort of positional adjustments to get dominance over your opponent's weapon, and then bam, you stab them through the head and they die. I mean, it's it's. Um, I often get asked whether I choreograph fights, and I very occasionally you know, do one as a favor to a friend. But generally speaking, fight direction is a separate discipline because, as I see it, um, on stage or screen, everyone should see what's happening and nobody dies. But in the arts that I practice, no one should see what just happened and somebody dies. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a very important distinction. Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's um you know, there are there are lots of, should we say, uh crossover skills, you know, blade handling, footwork, that kind of stuff, but the fundamental intention behind stage combat is different to the fundamental intention behind historical combat. So I you know, I when I go to the movies, I if it, if if a sword fight if it, if it's a serious film, I tend to just kind of look away during the sword fights because I don't want to ruin the film. Um, if it's a like a fun film, like maybe The Knight's Tale, for instance, um, I watch the whole thing because the whole thing is tongue in cheek anyway. So you wouldn't expect mm-hmm. the fights to be real. But as as one friend of mine put it when he saw the first Lord of the Rings movie in like two thousand three, he said, "Oh, guy." And my whole life growing up, Aragorn was my hero, and I am gutted to find out that I could hammer him in a sword fight. <laughs> Is there anything that you've come across that you've seen that you've thought, actually, that's that's pretty realistic, that's really stood out? The duelists would be the, the standout example. Um, but, I mean, like, okay, a good stage fight or screen fight, it's it shouldn't look real because it, it you know it's it, it would be it would be rubbish on the screen it just wouldn't work like okay the, the best the best rapier duel of all time without question is princess bride okay oh. there's this fantastic long um, fight in the princess bride at the top of the cliffs of insanity i have watched that fight it must be 50 times at the very least <laughs> um and it just fits the movie perfectly, right? And it's it's a glorious, glorious fight. It has nothing to do with actual historical combat. I actually wrote a blog post about it. Um, so if you if you go to my blog, you can you can find um, and, and search it for the Princess Bride. This you know, I, I I look at how it should really have gone, and because they're actually talking about um, ah, so you're using Rocco's, um, you're using Bonetti's defense against me. Huh? Oh, I thought it fitting considering the trade. Naturally, you must expect me to attack with Capafaro, right? So they, they they name all these historical fencing masters, which actually existed, and we actually know how they would have fought. And so I have a little video going. Well, if you attack with Capafaro, it looks like this. And the other, ah, but I find that Tibol cancels out Capafaro. Well, okay, this is, this is how I think Tibol's style would cancel out Capafaro's style, right? And the, the video I put together would make an absolutely shit sword fight for the Princess Bride movie. It just wouldn't work. It would just be too short, too boring. And yeah, it, it just, it's not, yeah, you can't have a, um, a really accurate rapier fight on screen and make it look good, I don't think. Now, I, if any of my colleagues who are fight directors are listening to this, please email me and say challenge accepted and prove me wrong because that would be all <laughs> i think are you possibly the only person in the world ever that's brought up the princess bride in the context of a conversation about great martial arts scenes in films oh no way no way I mean, have, 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 have any look up any any sort of one of those daft um internet lists of things and you know look for a list of like 10 best movie fights the prince okay. bride deal is in pretty much all of them because it is it's just epic yeah carrie elwes and mandy patinkin ah yes fabulous one of the really interesting ideas you have is that you can take principles from martial arts training and apply them in your wider life can you tell us more about that well as i see it as a swordsmanship instructor a swordsmanship practitioner uh, the sword is the lens through which i see the world and any kind of decision i make is always influenced by how i approach training so 
for instance, uh, swords are obviously dangerous, so we bang on about safety a lot. So I tend to have a different approach to risk than most people. I am super careful when driving and I am super relaxed when flying because statistically speaking, the chances of me getting killed on a plane is much, much lower than the chance of me getting killed in a car. Okay. I am properly frightened of cheeseburgers and I am not particularly frightened of serial killers because the chances of dying from a bad diet is much, much higher than the chance of dying because somebody decided to kill me. That's a very strict emphasis on the statistics, isn't it? Well, absolutely. And, but that's the thing when, so when I'm create, when I created my school, I had to figure out what was actually dangerous and what was actually safe. And a lot of the things we do appear to be dangerous, but are actually safe. And the good rule of thumb is you need a physically safe space for training psychologically dangerous things. And you need a psychologically safe place or safe space for training physically dangerous things. Uh, if you have a place that is both physically and psychologically dangerous, that's usually a very bad training environment. Okay. So um, that, that's, that's one thing. Another would be uh, how I think about conflict and or any kind of strategic decision. I am much more interested in creating a stable base from which it is safe to explore than I am from just going off willy nilly. So I'm, I'm okay. In swordsmanship circles, I reckon to be very, very sensible, right? Because I don't take silly risks in the wider world. Many people seem to think I'm a, I'm a mad risk taker because I, I do things that appear to be dangerous. Like for example, um, I'm scared of heights. So whenever I go and teach at my school in Seattle, or this club that I, I train at, or I teach at regularly in Seattle, called Lonin, which operate inside a circus facility, they have access to a flying trapeze set up. Mm-hmm. And I am scared of heights. So it is physically absolutely safe because you know they don't let beginners like me on the flying trapeze unsupervised you're strapped into a harness and there's a professional standing there on the top of the platform and there's a professional on the other end of the rope that you are also suspended from so even if you just like had a complete i don't know mental break and just kind of fell off which nobody ever does you would just be lowered gently down into the net and of course there's a net right it could not be physically Mm. safer it's much more dangerous driving to the facility than it is standing on top of the um, trapeze platform. But I'm scared of heights. So, you know, going out there, I'm absolutely my physically terrified. But because I know it's safe, I go and do it to practice dealing with fear. So I have this sort of, ex- I, I, I seek out these opportunities to practice dealing with difficult things and practice dealing with the sorts of things that lead to bad decisions. So fear is like the classic stimulus to a really poor decision. Um, okay. Let me, that, that gets into tricky territory. Gavin DeBecker wrote a brilliant book called the gift of fear, uh, which uh, explains how your instinct about things and people and situations is usually right and you should trust it more often that's the kind of the basic message of the book and he's absolutely right but the uh, if you're going to live an interesting life you're going to have to do things that scare you like for instance i don't know appearing on a radio show or um <laughs> or, or you know being interviewed that, that's that's scary or, or or standing up in front of a bunch of people you don't know and talking to them or you know there are all sorts of things which are frightening but to have really getting life, out of your comfort zone. Yeah. To have an interesting life, you're going to have to be able to deal with that sort of fear. And the first step is identifying what the actual risk is. And the second step is if you've determined that the actual risk is acceptable in terms of psychological, potential psychological damage or potential physical damage, um, then practicing being able to experience the fear and then and yet do the thing you've decided to do 
right? And if you think about it, it's all training for a sword fight because an actual real sword fight with somebody trying to murder you with a big sharp sword is probably about as frightening as anything can be. Um, and obviously we don't actually do that because, you know, murder is illegal and it's a very bad idea to go around killing people with swords. But um, we are training for that environment and that requires us to be able to stand our ground when we are terrified. Um, and even to maybe convert terror into elation. Yeah. And there is nothing quite like quite as good at converting terror into elation is if you're scared of heights, getting on a flying trapeze. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's really, 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 really frightening. But practicing that sort of thing means that it's much easier for me if I've decided that something is a good idea in terms of the risk profile, I can go ahead and do it whether I'm scared or not. Hmm. Right? So it's been transformative in my quality of life to be able to see things that way and to train for them that way. So it's like a cost benefit analysis there of can you learn something from that situation that right. outweighs the risk of it? Yeah, I mean I am I have no interest in base jumping. But when when my youngest child becomes a fully independent adult, I have every intention of trying skydiving. Mm -hmm. Right? I it it is actually significantly more dangerous than um many other activities. So I would wait until my youngest child is no longer dependent. Um, but, you know, when that happens, I am looking forward to actually jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. Because, again, I'm scared of heights, and that would be a really, 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 really frightening experience that is safe enough for the reward to be probably worth the risk. Um, but, you know, most people, um, in my experience, don't approach risk quite in the same way and are perhaps less conscious about what they're actually afraid of um i mean for for instance i gave a talk in america a couple of years ago and it wasn't in a sword fighting convention sword fighting conventions are my comfort zone now i used to be scared of teaching at them but now i'm like i've done them so many times i'm comfortable with them so i seek out less comfortable opportunities and i was talking to a bunch of people who don't know anything about swords and I thought, oh, God, what am I going to do? Um, okay. And it was a 12-minute talk. I can talk for an hour, and I can I can talk for a minute, but 12 minutes is what? What do I even do? So I prepared a speech and everything, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to take a sword. And that's basically me taking a comfort blanket with me, right? <laughs> so I'm standing there in front of this audience with this great big sword. And, you know, just, just holding the sword is, is relaxing because, of course, the, the only thing at risk there was my ego. If I did a bad job, they might not like me, right? And these are people, the actual, the rational risk uh, analysis there, it, it, well, there's no risk at all because these aren't people I know or depend on for anything. So they can't suddenly, I don't know, fire me or whatever. I want to do a good job for the organizer who's invited me and it would be very embarrassing if I fail. But he's a really nice bloke, so he'd forgive me. So he, he, I wasn't even really risking anything at all, but it's one of those things that is just frightening. And it, it boils down to basically a fear of ostracism, right? We are, we are genetically programmed to want to be part of the tribe. And being ostracized from the tribe, you know, in our hunter-gatherer past would have been basically a death sentence. So we have a mortal fear of being ostracized and a mortal fear of embarrassment. It is literally a mortal fear. It feels like the fear of death. And so going and standing on that stage with a sword and pretending to be completely calm and in control, it's perfect sword training, right? So, <laughs> so, so it goes both ways. It's like the sword, I use real world, real life stuff to train for swordsmanship and I use swordsmanship to train for real life stuff. So it's not, it doesn't just go in one direction. It goes back and forth. Hmm. That's really interesting. And, and, and the talk went fine. And people came out to me afterwards and said they enjoyed it. And, you know, I even completely cheated. Right. Here's another, <laughs> here's, here's another thing you learn from swordsmanship, right? You don't, if it's a frightening situation, you want to prepare everything in advance and um, wherever possible, cheat. So, so what I did 
what I did is I took the opening lines from Henry V, oh, for a muse of fire, that speech, right? And I kind of strode onto the stage, whipped the sword out of the scabbard, pointed it in the sky, went, oh, for a muse of fire, da, 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 right? And that got their attention, <laughs> right? I can't act. I don't know how to act. I've never had an acting lesson in my life. But it, it worked because it got me moving, right? It was something that I could do to get me from the hiding in a corner behind my sword from all those scary people feeling and up on the stage and moving and starting to talk. And once I start talking, as you've probably noticed, I have no difficulty <laughs> keeping going, <laughs> right? So, so again, that was a trick from swordsmanship. What do you do? In a in a sword fight, if you're not, you know, if if you're if you're lacking in in confidence or whatever, what you have to do is put on a brave show, okay? And you know, one way of doing this, you start from way out of measure and you start coming forward with big slices and cuts and things, and you look big and scary, and it gets you moving, and it gets you moving forwards towards the opponent, and that by itself. Um, gets rid of the the biggest problem of fear, which is it freezes you. So yeah. it's a bit of a fake it till you make it. Absolutely, kind of idea. absolutely, yeah. Fake it, fake it till you make it. Precisely. <laughs> and um, preparation there, you you were talking about as well. Yeah, yeah. Pre- prepare um, for the predictable things, but but again, in a sword fight. If you over-prepare, if you decide, I'm going to do this action and you're going to do that action, and then when you do that action, so let's say I'm going to do A, you're going to do B, I'll do C, you'll do D, and then I'll hit you with E, what happens is I do A, you do F, and I die. Yeah. <laughs> right? So you must you must plan. You must have a an intention. I'm going to do A, and you must know what the possible responses to that are, okay, inside your style or outside it. And you must have a simple set of commands running in your head to deal with the threat. So the command should be something along the lines of control the weapon and strike. So my job with A is to get your sword moving in a predictable path so I can control it. If I do A and I'm... You know, I have plans for B, but you go and do F. I am trying to control your weapon, so I'm not in control of your weapon yet, so I move against F and go GH. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? So, you know, your opponent will not follow your script. Um, and a really good trick, actually, in, in sword fighting and in, in sales and all sorts of other areas of life is you you get your opponent to run a story in their head that that ends up where you want it to go okay so you know i might i might tell you a story with my body language because you are you're some big strong aggressive person i might tell you a story with my body language that i am actually you know intimidated and frightened and those might actually be true but i'm trying to communicate that to you which gets you to be overconfident that lures you onto my prepared ground yeah. And the way I think of it is surprise is a condition that exists only in the mind of the opponent. Okay. <laughs> if, you know, if, if you and I were fencing and you suddenly sprouted wings and breathed fire at me, I would be surprised because that would violate the laws of nature. Okay. <laughs> but if you threw your sword at me, you might hit me with it, but I wouldn't be surprised because that is within the bounds of the possible. Okay. So as with all sorts of things, it's your expectations that screw you up in fencing and in, in life. If you have this expectations are all about a story you've told yourself about what's going to happen. But if you understand that your opponent has a mind of their own or the world will operate in ways that you cannot predict, then you don't have to, uh, you don't have to get over the surprise to deal with the situation. You can just move smoothly to deal with whatever occurs. 
Yeah. So something there about having some kind of loose plan or loose object objective, yeah. but you can be flexible enough to adapt as right. things change. Yeah, and, and self-talk is a lot of that. So, you know, if you have a story in your head and your opponent departs from the script or the world departs from the script, then you're stuck and you're lost. But if your story is something along the lines of keep moving, control the weapon and strike, you'll keep moving, you'll control their weapon and eventually strike. Or, I mean, you can still lose, but you're not going to lose because you were suckered. You're going to lose because your opponent was faster or better or more experienced or whatever. Okay. Um, and the same is, you know, how many times do we actually get what we actually expect? Um, and very often, you know, we, we miss out on opportunities in life because we weren't expecting them. And so when they appeared, we didn't act on them. And, you know, I can think of examples of that in my own life, but they're a lot rarer now because I have a much better handle on the, the story generating engine in my head that creates expectations. And that's entirely down to source and practice. Uh, Guy, yeah. this is something I could talk about for <laughs> hours and hours. Sure. Um, if I'm if I'm going to fit this in with the length of other recordings, <laughs> I should probably should probably, probably wind it up. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, but do you do you want to mention some of the things you, you've written? A whole bunch of books in this topic. Your teaching and other things in your podcast. Um, well, I think if if the listeners are interested in the sort of stuff I've been, well, if they're still with me after all this time. <laughs> <laughs> on, on this podcast sorry i do tend to go on a bit uh they probably the best thing to do is for them to toddle along to my website at guywindsor.com it will redirect to the current site and where well, i have you know, books and online courses and blog posts and things like that and um if so if they're interested in any particular aspect of swordsmanship they should be able to find some something on about it on on my website and you know i i welcome people getting in touch with me with questions and what have you um there's a contact form on the site for that um just one thing i have a life and i <laughs> i have a, a very strict policy that i don't answer work emails over the weekend and someone contacting me from out of the blue can reasonably expect a reply within about five working days i think that's reasonable and did you say you were working on another book? Yeah, um, I've produced a few books lately. Um, my last is an incredibly geeky, in-depth look at Fiore de Libere's techniques for the longsword. It's called From Medieval Manuscript to Modern Practice. Um, but if you're not specifically interested in longsword plays from the Middle Ages, that's not going to be your jam. But I am currently working on a book um, which is all about lessons for real life from swordsmanship practice so uh that will probably be of more interest so maybe i should come back and talk about that another time because i've only literally started writing it about two weeks ago so it's in this that sounds stages. like a great idea <laughs> okay that's brilliant guy that's really enjoyable thanks very much for your time well thanks for having me lee it's been a pleasure <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this episode. You can find out more about the podcast and upcoming episodes at curiositycake.co.uk and on Twitter at curiosity underscore cake. Curiosity cake.